Uh, we have Penny Green, who is the head of the research team who spoke uh, this morning. Thomas McManus um, to the left. Where, where is Thomas? There you are. <laughs> and Alicia Delacour Venning. Uh, I understand they have done uh, more than four months of research in Rakhine State and uh, are coming soon out with a report on, um, on the situation. Um, Penny? Yes. Yes, I mean, I, I want to speak only very briefly, and I want to, to leave Tom and Alicia, who spent the greater part of the time of our research, um, sorry, um, who spent the greater part of um, the time, their time in Rakhine State and, and Yangon, and Alicia was also, also spent some time in Bangladesh. This research project um, was funded by the Economic and Social uh, Research Council of the UK, and the project was to investigate whether or not the persecution faced by the Rohingya uh, had reached some kind of genocidal tipping point or was in fact genocide. So that was the question that we set out to answer. Um, <clears throat> and on the basis of the data we gathered, as I uh, mentioned this morning, our conclusion is very clear that we are witnessing a genocide, that we are in the middle of the process, that we are at the stage prior to mass annihilation. Um, there are three researchers in our team, as Anne mentioned, uh, and one of the tasks ahead of us uh, is to benchmark our findings against the established stages and phases of genocide uh, uh, in, in relation to previous genocides, in relation to the Holocaust, in relation to Cambodia, Rwanda. Um, and so that's something that we will be doing <coughs> over the summer, and we will be uh, releasing our report in September. So I'm going to now hand over to Tom and Alicia, uh, and have a PowerPoint presentation as well. And um, thank you very much. And while they get that ready, I do want to say thank you very much to the organizers for arranging this fantastic event, and in particular to Zani because this is something very special and it comes at, a, at an extraordinary moment in the history of the Rohingya. Thank you, Penny. And I want to reiterate Penny's thanks to the conference organizers for uh, this very important conference we're all at here today. Um, so we are going to go through the stages of genocide as we see it. Um, there's been a lot of work in the social sciences about genocide over the years, and Daniel Fairstein has painstakingly taken, taken the vast majority, the majority of it together uh, and has created the stages that we use. And I'll just first go through what those stages are. Uh, stage one is stigmatization. Then we have harassment followed by isolation. Stage four, which is the stage that we are looking at now in Rakhine State as the major stage is systematic weakening. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, the first three stages uh, and then Alicia, my colleague, is gonna talk about stage four. Um, and just to note that stage five is annihilation. So it's at a very worrying point um, from our point of view. Um, these stages are a way of trying to understand and analyze a situation like this. They overlap heavily. Uh, stages don't, do not stop before the next stage starts, uh, so just keep that in mind as we go through it. So first of all, stigmatization. The Rohingya have been stigmatized in a variety of different ways uh, that have all worked together to other them. They have been othered as a group, an individual group, a, a negative other as we call it. Uh, one way is by the government calling them illegal, illegal Bengali, um, illegal, calling people illegal immigrants works in most parts of the world. It works well in Europe and Australia uh, among other countries, so this is quite a, a powerful stigmatization. Um, another stigmatization that we get from the members of groups of the Sangha, uh, especially the Mabatha group, is that they are dangerous uh, Muslims, that we need to worry about the destruction of Buddhism, and that's what uh, Islam is all about, the destruction of other religions. Um, the monks tell us that 
uh, Mus uh, that Muslims are uh, dangerous, uh, that they are not to be trusted, um, and that all, if we want to know about this, all we have to do is turn on the news and we'll see about Islamic State, which leads on to another kind of stigmatization, this terrorism stigmatization. Again, a very powerful way of stigmatizing a group to make people suspicious about their terrorist links and the possibilities of a jihad in the state. Um, and another stigmatization is based on race. Uh, as we heard from participants earlier, based on the color of your skin, the appearance from different districts of Asia, um, and the word that we have been used by authorities, monks, and members of the public in Rakhine State is the word Kalar, which we understand to be a, a derogatory term for their own Hindu people. And I'm sure everyone here can verify that. Sorry, I was one slide behind. Two minutes. The next stage is harassment. This is when the verbal harassment becomes physical harassment. And we have bullying, which sounds like a very kind of fluffy word, but it's a social science word that we use for the physical harassment of uh, a group. The violence of June and October 2012, we had the destruction of houses, businesses, and mosques. We are told by the authorities that this was spontaneous. Our research shows that this was not spontaneous, that it was organized, highly organized. Um, the village administrators told us, Rakhine village administrators told us that they received letters days in advance of the violence, that they were to be ready, that all males between the ages of 20 and 40 had to be ready for buses to pick them up and bring them down to Sitwe. Uh, for the violence that was to ensue. So these buses did come on the day in the morning. There was a, a large fleet. Um, they brought the groups of men down to Sitwe, uh, where they were provided with catering. Uh, they had their lunch, and then they were told how to uh, kind of beat the bush to move the Muslim community away from their homes uh, and down towards Bume Junction and towards the camps, the camp compound uh, where uh, thousands of Rohingya live today. Um, this has led to the justification of security. People are uh, told they're in these camps for their own protection. This is something we saw that the Jews were voluntarily went to camps uh, during uh, Nazi Germany, again for their own protection. Um, we also have the removal of rights, disenfranchisement with the white cards, which we all know about. And then there's the impunity. Why has no one been prosecuted for all the deaths that happened during this um, campaign of violence? The Attorney General told us that it was because it happened at night, um, which is just not a, a, a credible explanation why there was absolutely zero prosecutions for all that violence. Uh, and the next stage is isolation. Uh, and as we have heard all day today, the Rohingya are currently isolated both in camps and outside the camps in Northern Rakhine State. They cannot go anywhere. They're isolated from the international community. Um, they, the international community on the ground are afraid to speak about it because MSF nearly spoke about it and were kicked out of the entire country. And this is another form of isolation. Um, they're cut off basically from the outside world from each other, and this group has now been isolated. Sorry, and there is just a picture of Amingala Ghetto as well, and the sign on the picture says, register here please, international organizations and foreigners. for being here and of course the organizers for having us. So I will go now on to speak about systematic weakening, which is stage four of Ferris Stein's process. And of course, as Tom and Penny have already mentioned, this is where we feel we're currently at. Now, Ferris Stein says that once the victims have been isolated from the rest of society, so mainstream Myanmar society, the perpetrators typically implement a series of measures aimed at weakening the targeted population systematically. And of course, as I've already mentioned, this is the stage prior to mass annihilation. Now, as we all know, many speakers have already said, um, 
described these conditions, of course, the Rohingya are subject to both psychological as well as physical destruction. They've been stripped of all human agency and dignity, and they're living in decrepit conditions. They're subject to overcrowding, there's no opportunity to engage in livelihood activities, and they rely almost solely on WFP food deliveries once a month, which are in fact often late and are not sufficient to sustain a population for a significant number of years. The food that is provided is the bare minimum. It does not provide the sufficient nutrients that people need to maintain a healthy existence. Of course, lack of health care, as we've heard already, is a huge issue. Malnutrition amongst children, as has already been spoken about, and indeed MSF being expelled in February 2014. Now, of course, given MSF was the biggest health provider for Rohingya, in IDP camps, ghettos, the Angwingalai ghetto, as well as in northern Rakhine state at the time. This was a very significant loss for the community. And of course, we saw in 2014 March, the humanitarian infrastructure was destroyed. Now that has been recovered, thankfully. Nonetheless, it was a huge, did have huge implications for the humanitarian provisions. Now, another thing that we've seen is the Emergency Coordination Centre, which I'm sure all of you know about, which has been set up essentially to regulate the provision of aid, both developmental and humanitarian, to ensure that it's granted 50-50 to both Rohingya as well as Rakhine. Now, of course, Rakhine did um, suffer from displacement during the violence in 2012, but we all know that the Rohingya suffered to the largest extent, of course, and um, that you know, offering this 50-50 division is, is, is just not sustainable. However, this, this body was set up, and what is most concerning about this body, really, is that it provides a platform for Rakhine extremists and their racist ideology, and that is what is of real concern. Just to give you a snapshot of this ideology, um, I'm sure you all know already, but something that was said to us, this is a quote um, from a member of the ECC in Situé from November last year, the UN and INGOs are only helping the Muslim community. They're helping Muslims to take over land in Rakhine State. The Muslim population is increasing and the UN is still helping them to survive. Because of the support of INGOs to Bengalis, many Rakhine are losing their lands and also suffering. Now this illustrates the, the terrifying ideology um, on behalf of the, the, the Rakhine nationalists and of course the ECC in a way legitimizes this ideology which is very concerning. So another aspect of systematic weakening, of course, we are seeing the Rohingya live in broken communities. They have no opportunity to, to engage in any kind of social cohesion. They are a broken community and they cannot um, join together, they cannot have strong civil society movements inside the country in order to resist. They are experiencing humiliation, abuse, harassment. And another thing that was reported to us during our research was um, corruption of camp committee members. Now, of course, um, within the, the IDP camps themselves, the camp committees have been set up in order to distribute aid effectively to the communities. Now, the camp committee members were largely appointed by the authorities, um, and something that we're seeing, unfortunately, now is, is, is corruption. So these camp authorities are um, requesting bribes, for example, financially, as well as um, sexual favours um, in terms of the returning, providing basically shelter as well as food and other non-food items. Now this is of course really concerning, but it is not surprising. When you systematically weaken a population, you destroy them, you dehumanize them, of course these things are, are bound to, to come out, and of course this happened um, in 1930s Nazi Germany also, where Jewish people in the ghettos, for example, were given authority to draw up family lists of people that would be deported and sent for extermination, and these people who held positions of power, Jewish people, would request uh, financial bribes as well as things like jewellery um, in order to have family members saved. So this is simply a result of the extreme systematic weakening that the Rohingya have been subject to. And just... I think this is the last thing, um, time is tight, but I just wanted to speak briefly about the comparative camp conditions. And I've got some images here. So this is a Rakhine IDP camp in Situé. Now, as I mentioned, of course, um, the Rakhine were displaced also. And you can see here um, quite a wide street going down the middle. You can see um, the individual houses here. Each Rakhine family has their own self-sustaining home. Um, they have 
you know, elaborate drainage pipes down the side here. You can't quite see, but there's a, a good solid concrete drainage system as well put in place in order to drain the area during rainy season. The houses are raised so families can keep animals and, and cook below. And each family also has their own toilet in these camps. Okay, or they look more like little villages. Um, and then comparatively Rohingya IDP camps. So we can see here this one on the left. This is an unregistered um, area of the camp in Situé. And of course, you know, Tarpaul in very absolutely deplorable um, condition that this family is living in. And then on the far side here, we see this is um, a, a, a picture of a lot of the long houses. So you have 10 houses in a row and one family per house that are on the ground. So they're subject to flooding during rainy season, of course. There is actually only one toilet at the end for, for 10 families. And the rooms are very, very small. Just the last, the last page here, um, just want to share another quote from the Arakan National Spokesperson. Actually, there's two quotes here from him um, which demonstrates systematic weakening. Um, first one, when the international community give the Rohingya a lot of food and a lot of donations, they grow fat and they become stronger and they will become more violent. So again, this reflects the, the ideology um, that is of, of great concern to all of us. And then he also goes on to say, in terms of the, the what we should do next, well, we need to implement the 1982 law, and the people that do not have citizenship should be kept in prison. But actually, there are so many people that the government can't keep people in prisons. So they should have concentration camps to house those people who don't have citizenship. Oh, sorry, not concentration camps, detention centers. Thank you, Alicia. The next speaker is Matthew Smith, who is the executive director of uh, Fortify Rights, uh, formerly with uh, Human Rights Watch. Um, Matt has uh, extensive experience uh, doing uh, research and advocacy work in Rakhine State. Uh, he was there, I understand, uh, during the violence of 2012 and returns from Rakhine just a couple of days ago. So um, please try to stay within 10 minutes, 10 minutes. less if possible. <laughs> I'll do my best. Thank you so much. Um, and and I and I, before this started, we were actually thinking that the crowd was going to be much thinner than it is. So I commend you all for uh, still being here this afternoon. And, and thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers. Um, and there are many people here who work tremendously hard. And it dawned on me that um, uh, you know, probably one of the most relaxing things they've been able to do, particularly our colleagues from Myanmar, one of the most relaxing things they've been able to do in a long time is attend a conference in Norway on genocide. Um, and this, this, I think, gives uh, 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 an indication of just how serious the situation is. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very honored to be uh, up here with uh, my fellow colleagues. Um, special thanks also to the Norwegian Burma Committee and to Partners Relief and Development that made it possible for me to, to, to come here. Um, our mandate at Fortify Rights is to investigate abuses uh, in much the same way as international human rights organizations. And the other side of our work, which we're hoping to scale up, is to provide technical support to human rights defenders. Uh, I've got a colleague in the U.S. who's fond of saying that the people who are closest to the problems are closest to the solutions. And this is what drives us. And so this is, this is part, of, uh, part of our mandate in wanting to strengthen responses to human rights violations in Myanmar. And it was mentioned earlier today that uh, change will come in Myanmar. The international community has a role to play, a very important role to play. Uh, but of course, uh, the people of Myanmar uh, likewise have an important role to play. Um, so I've been asked to discuss some of our findings and documentation in Rakhine State. Um, uh, in some ways, it's redundant. You've heard a lot of this, and there's a lot of gloom and doom. I want to first just mention a couple positive things, uh, and there are a couple. Um, we're starting to hear people in Myanmar use the word Rohingya, Rohingya more often now. Um, uh, and I think uh, this has to do with all of your work, frankly. Uh, and so I think that's a positive thing. It's, it's very small, uh, but to hear, to hear the word used more often, I think, uh, is, is positive. 
Second thing is we have had conversations with Rakhine. Um, uh, most are human rights activists. For about five years before I, I was working with Human Rights Watch and now Fortify Rights, I did a significant amount of work with Rakhine human rights activists. We're starting to see more uh, positive, subtle, but positive messages coming from them. Um, and so this is just something I, I, I think uh, is worth mentioning. Um, lately, we've been focusing a lot on people taking to the seas. We're documenting rape, torture, killings on, uh, on the ships that are operated by transnational criminal syndicates in collusion with the Myanmar authorities, in collusion with Thai authorities and others. Um, we've got uh, a team in Indonesia right now actually meeting with uh, new arrivals there. Boats are still arriving. There are still several boats stranded at sea. Um, the central question today, of course, is with regard to root causes. So uh, I won't say too much about the situation at, at sea. Um, we are approaching the three-year anniversary of uh, the, the initial wave of attacks. And it's been mentioned that the abuses uh, that the uh, Rohingya population have endured have been going on for a very long time. Um, but just as a temporal point of reference, we're approaching a three-year anniversary and the situation is getting worse. So to the initial question about um, uh, the international narrative being that the situation has somehow stabilized, um, we feel very strongly that it's a false barometer. To measure the, the situation in Rakhine State, in terms of whether or not there are widespread massacres taking place is a false barometer. Uh, we're documenting systematic human rights violations still. So if anything has stabilized, it's been that. And that is very unfortunate indeed, and we're working to change that. Um, so in both, uh, as mentioned, I was in Rakhine State uh, shortly after the violence started in June, and then again in October 2012. In both waves of violence, there were systematic attacks um, we documented very similar patterns of abuse in different parts of the state, particularly in October. Um, and this demonstrated to us a certain level of organization. Um, there was, as Thomas mentioned, there was widespread and systematic uh, and very transparent community organizing. Uh, you mentioned uh, um, uh, letters being exchanged. Um, there were meetings being held. There were, there were letters being sent to the central government. Uh, and, and all indications were that there was going to be a significant act of violence. Um, nothing was done to stop it. Um, uh, and, and of course, in October, it happened again. Um, there were meetings. There were pamphlets. Uh, I happened to be with uh, a, a young Rakhine monk on the day that he actually wrote one of the first pamphlets calling for the exclusion of the Muslim community. Um, and, and I asked him about uh, what his pamphlet included and why. Um, and this hasn't been mentioned too much. It was alluded to uh, by Alicia that the terrifying I ideology um, that many uh, extremists in Rakhine State hold. But I think it's important to emphasize that um, there are a lot of fears. They're very unreasonable fears, but there are a lot of fears within the Rakhine Buddhist community. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that they, they actually feel these fears. They think, because they're told and their emotions and, and, and their thoughts and ideas have been manipulated by certain people, but they're told that, uh, that Rohingya and that Muslims are going to take over their land. They're told that they're going to take over the country politically and economically. And they actually fear, they actually believe that their culture is under threat. We all know that's not true. Uh, but I think in terms of trying to understand uh, this, this ideology, we have to understand that, that there are a number of people who are genuinely believing these things. And this has, of course, led people to commit atrocious acts of violence. Um, and this in no way, acknowledging this in no way condones any of that, obviously. Um, but uh, we struggle with this. We try to understand how could one human being treat another human being this way. Um, and, and, uh, and, and in our discussions with people, these are, these are the things that we're starting to glean from that. Um, the role of the government. The government, state-run media has, has uh, inflamed the situation. Um, government officials have inflamed the situation. Um, it's, not, it's not outside of the government's ability 